What's up and welcome back to another episode of Gizmo Slip Tech. Today we're taking a look at the Intel Core Ultra 9 285H and we're going to be comparing it against the previous generation version, the 185H, as well as the Ryzen AI9HX370, which is their flagship for thin and lighter laptops. Now this episode is sponsored by Intel. Big shout out and thank you to them for sending over Lenovo IdeaPad Pro 5i for me to test. All the tests that I've done in this video have been following an exact same methodology and they've all been done live on live stream. So if you wanna go and review exactly how they were done, Comparing all the three tests together, you can do that. Now I've got graphs today that, and doing some a little bit deeper dives into the data that we collected. Without further ado, let's go over the test specs on the different computers that we tested. And it is pretty important to know the differences. So this is the Lenovo IdeaPad Pro 5i. This is a thinner, more portable, fairly premium chassis. I gotta say, pretty impressed with the build quality on this. This isn't really a review of the laptop itself, that said, this laptop does not push the 285H to the maximum peak wattage potential. I do expect to see slightly better performance in higher performance, bigger cooling, thicker laptops that, are, uh, that can push the wattage a little bit higher. For example, let's take a look exactly at what I mean. So the Intel Core Ultra 9 285H here has 16 cores, 16 threads, but most importantly, the peak power can go to 115 watts. And we do see that for just a few seconds before it starts throttling down to about 80 watts. And then after several runs at Cinebench, it goes down to 65 watts sustained. Now, the Zephyrus G16 that I tested for both the Core Ultra 9 185H and the Ryzen AI9 HX370, those ones could go to higher power limits. So the Ryzen chip peaks at 80 watts of power and sustains 70 watts long term. The Zephyrus G16 with the 185 peaks at 113 watts and sustains 93 watts on a continuous basis. This provides a lot more power throughput to things like Cinebench R23, which uh, or, or other high power continuous testing applications. The, the specs are also quite a bit different. The new Intel Core Ultra 9 285H drops hyper-threading. So you're looking at the core counts, you're looking at 16 cores, 16 threads on the 285H, but on the 185H, 16 cores, 22 threads. So we have hyper-threading on the six performance cores, and that does affect multi-core rendering performance as well. Ryzen AI 9, on the other hand, has four Zen 5 cores and eight Zen 4 cores that are more like efficiency cores in this scenario, but a total of 12 cores, 24 threads, does provide a lot of multi-core rendering performance. In the past, Intel has struggled to be as power efficient as the Ryzen chips, especially the last couple of years. And Intel this time has moved to a three nanometer node process. This really improves the IPC, the instructions per clock cycle, and a performance per watt basis. Um, and especially since we're talking less threads, and still very similar levels of performance. Now the other big thing about the processor is that we have this new Intel Arc 140T graphics card, uh, which is a huge upgrade. And that's this, this integrated GPU inside the CPU now becomes powerful enough to actually run a lot of games as you will see here in a moment. Now Intel also launched Intel XESS2, which includes XESS frame generation, which is currently only in a handful of games. XESS Super Resolution, which is the upscaling solution, um, has been improved. And there's this new XELL or XE Low Latency, which basically improves responsiveness. Let's dive into the performance benchmarks. We have Geekbench 6.3 here. The Intel Core Ultra 9 285H actually beats the Ryzen chip 17,513 versus 15,572. And it's a, a, a very large performance gain for the Core Ultra 9 versus the 185H. That's a pretty large generational gap, especially in single core performance, but also in multi-core performance. Now, I don't love Geekbench as a benchmarking tool, but it's a popular test, uh, so that's why I include it. We're talking about a 57.5 gen on gen improvement from Intel 43,213 beating out the Ryzen AI 9 HX370 with 42,747. Uh, you know, the 185H 
It had some gaming potential, but many of the modern games actually struggled to hit enjoyable frame rates. Like they would have 1% low struggles and the average frame rate also, it often was not as enjoyable of a gaming experience, like noticeably worse than say an expensive gaming laptop. But with the new Intel Core Ultra 9 285H, I think we're talking about enough GPU performance improvement to where the, the, the modern casual gamer could be pretty happy with a lot of the gameplay that we're seeing coming out of the 285H. Like 99% of games now are gonna play smooth enough to have an enjoyable experience. Looking at the handbrake rendering test, this has two purposes. First, we have a raw data processing multi-core performance workload. That is the longer bar here. Shorter is better. So the Ryzen AI9 HX370 still wins out here. Keep in mind, we have a higher power limit on the Zephyrus G16 here. And then we also have more cores and threads uh, and yet the Core Ultra 9 285H is very close. And it does have a gen on gen performance improvement here in Handbrake, beating out the 185H, even though it has a lower power limit on this 285H. Uh, in addition, we saw Intel QuickSync take the victory against the Ryzen AI 9, both with the 185H and the 285H, the lead just getting larger for Intel in the Handbrake rendering test. When switching over to DaVinci Resolve, however, using Intel QuickSync and VCN on the Ryzen chip, we did see the Ryzen chip outperform the Intel chip. Uh, we did also see a gen on gen performance improvement that was pretty significant, 1.32 minutes versus 1.55 minutes. I mean, it's not huge, but that's a nice to see an improvement even in the media encoders on the chip itself. We also did a speedometer test. This is a browser test uh, so it tests basically how quick and responsive your browser is. And the Ryzen chip had a lead on the 185H, but that has evaporated. The 285H is now significantly in the lead. For the A to 64 memory speed test, we saw good results from all three laptops. And quite frankly, they're all high enough that the performance will not be a noticeable difference. Very few times would you ever notice a difference simply from the memory speed. Just know that the memory speed on all three of these CPUs is plenty fast for basically all applications, uh, multitasking, gaming, all of it. It's gonna be really, really snappy and high performance on every system. Taking a look at the Cinebench R23, R20, and R24 results, we're looking at a significant lead from the Ryzen AI9 HX370. It makes a lot of sense because we have more cores and threads as well as a high power limit on the AMD chip. Um, the Intel Core Ultra 9 185H was behind before, even though it used more power. This time, the Intel Core Ultra 9 285 did not actually see much performance gain. Why is that? There's a few different reasons. Jumping back up to the chip information, again, the power limit on the sustained watts, which is the most important thing for the Cinebench scores, is significantly lower. We're talking about um, the 185H having almost a 50% larger power limit for its sustained power limit in the Zephyrus G16 compared to the IdeaPad Pro 5i. This is largely because the Zephyrus G16 has a vapor chamber cooler and can just sustain a higher power limit. So I'm anticipating the Core Ultra 9 285H in the Zephyrus G16 might be able to give the Ryzen AI 9 HX370 a run for its money, but we'll have to see. Uh, I do think that it does perform better at a higher power limit, but even when we ran the, the Core Ultra 9, at a high power limit, uh, reaching that first run performance of, you know, it's peaking to 100 watts in the IdeaPad Pro 5i, we still were only getting right around 21,000. So I'm anticipating uh, a, a lead still for the Ryzen AI HX370, even with a higher performance 285H chassis. Overall, the Cinebench results for the Core Ultra 9 make a lot of sense given the power limits plus the thread count reduction in the 285H. Reducing the thread count can hurt the multi-core render potential of a CPU, but it can improve the overall performance potential, especially for single threaded or applications that only need to use one, two, or three high performance threads, like a lot of video games. That's pretty much what a lot of video games focus on. Um, now this graph I think is super important. Cinebench R23 points per watt. The Ryzen AI 9 HX370 still shows the most performance per watt. On the Core Ultra 9, we have a huge 41% improvement gen on gen 
compared to the Core Ultra 9 185H. And the performance per watt is huge in gaming laptops because you can jam more performance in the same size chassis when you have more performance per watt. Now, let's get into some video game benchmarks. Baldur's Gate 3, we're talking QHD plus resolution, so 2560 by 1600 resolution with low quality graphics settings and FSR set to balanced. Still looks really good. You can run the game on higher settings and still get playable frame rates, but I'm trying to get like as high FPS as possible, so we went with the lowest settings. The Core Ultra 9 did 45 FPS, slightly behind the Ryzen AI 9 uh, HX370. And I think part of this is that Intel XESS 2 is not integrated in Baldur's Gate. You can only use FSR, and FSR I think is gonna work a little bit better on the Ryzen chip, because we did see some performance gains in The Witcher 3 when we jumped over to Intel XESS compared to FSR. The real story here though is not just the average FPS improvement, 45 versus 38, that's not a huge gain. The real big gain here is in the 1% lows, which shows that the architecture for the Intel Arc graphics are just better, more efficient, the cache is working better, things are not getting hitched up as much, which means that the overall smoothness of the gameplay is significantly improved. Like before, yeah, it was playable, but it was like, it was juddering a lot. And that judder can really bother some players. Counter-Strike 2, we're talking over 100 FPS on both the Ryzen AI9 HX370 and the Core Ultra 9 285H. We don't have a technical benchmark here, so we're just talking raw averages. And the Core Ultra 9 185H, I mean, it, it was playing Counter-Strike 2 pretty dang well. Not really a problem at 80 FPS, but 100 FPS is better and it's much more competitive with the Ryzen chip. Cyberpunk 2077, we're talking QHD+, low quality, FSR 3 on balance with frame gen on. So realistically, you're gonna wanna turn frame gen off here, but we, we turned it on just for the sake of the test. So 49 FPS on average for the Core Ultra 9 285H, 64 FPS for the Ryzen AI 9 HX370, and 37 FPS for the Core Ultra 9 185H. So a, a nice, significant performance gain God of War, we're just talking 39 FPS for a 1% low, 43 for our average, 47 and 48 for the Ryzen AI 9. Both of the frame time graphs looked really, really good, and it was very smooth gameplay. A huge performance uplift here for the 285H, 28 FPS versus 43. The Witcher 3, we saw 52 FPS for a 1% low, is huge, huge performance gain, 60 FPS on average. 38 for the 1% low for the Ryzen. So the, the new Intel Arc actually giving us better 1% low performance than the Ryzen in this scenario. In addition, when we switched over to Intel XESS, we saw a boost to our FPS, though I think XESS is not quite as clear as the FSR in terms of visual fidelity. That's a trade-off there. Uh, the Core Ultra 9 185H, still very playable at 44 and 37, but I mean, it's, it's a big performance gain, especially in the 1% low smoothness, as well as the overall average. So the, the Witcher 3 showing off the new Intel Arc graphics quite well. Now, we also tested five additional games only with the 285H. We did Black Myth Wukong, we did QHD Plus Low XESS at 25% render resolution, so basically on performance mode, 43 FPS on average. And we did adjust some settings, uh, for visual clarity, and it, it, it's possible to go up or down from this point, but very, very playable, even at QHD+, Plus with a lot of upscaling. Dying Light 2, QHD+, Plus, very low graphics, XESS on performance, 43 FPS. Hogwarts Legacy, in the middle of Hogsmeade, amazingly, we had better 1% low performance on the Intel Arc graphics than we did on some of the RTX 4090 laptops that we tested in Hogwarts last year. So overall, very impressed with 45 FPS on average, 30 for our 1% low. Um, just the fact that we can get these kinds of numbers at QHD with upscaling means that we could get even better results if we dropped it down to say 1080p with upscaling. Um, Marvel Rivals, we were all over the place with the frame rate in the middle of a uh, match, but it, it, the frame rate jumped anywhere from 45 all the way up to 90. I averaged it, I'd say 60. Um, but overall, Marvel's Rivals, extremely playable, very smooth. I would not recommend frame gen, even though frame gen can boost our frame rate up into the 80 to 100 range. 
uh, the additional latency just makes it harder to aim. So unless you're gonna play like a melee based character or something like that, or you don't have to aim very much, then I would really recommend keeping frame gen off for competitive shooters still. And last but not least, we also tested Monster Hunter Wilds, which is the new just released game that's super unoptimized. We managed to get 24 FPS. It was a very solid frame time graph and extremely, extremely low resolution and not clear enough, in my opinion, to even really play the game. It felt like I was playing a PlayStation 1 or PlayStation 2 game because the graphics were so upscaled and it's just so blurry, it's hard to, hard to actually even play. That said, Monster Hunter Wilds, it's a really demanding game. And, and I got to give a big shout out to Intel in this that they only claimed 22% performance improvement on their gaming titles when I think the performance improvement is actually higher than that, at least based on the five games that I tested and on the synthetic tests that we ran as well. Very impressive gains overall. So to sum it all up, the Intel 285H, we're talking about higher performance per watt, higher performance per thread. Uh, this one overall, however, less multi-core raw rendering performance in things like Cinebench, but improvements in DaVinci Resolve, improvements in internet browsing, and massive improvements in terms of gaming on the integrated graphics on the Intel Arc 140T. So I've got a bunch of RTX 5000 series laptops on the way. I'm excited to review them with you live. Join the live streams, come hang out. I appreciate all of you coming along with me on this journey. Thank you so much for your support. I will see you in the next one. Brandon out.